Okay, folks, uh, thanks for joining us tonight on this uh, beautiful Tuesday here in Iowa. Um, I'm going to go ahead and kick things off for this farm and hour people, while people are still logging in and getting settled here. Um, so I'm Steve Carlson. I work as a staff member at Practical Farmers of Iowa, and this is a PFI farm and hour. Uh, tonight's farm and our topic, as you know, is neonicotinoid seed treatments. And we've got PFI farmer Dick Sloan joining us from his farm in northeast Iowa tonight. And Dick's been collecting data for the past two years on seeds that are and are not treated with neonicotinoids. And then also joining us tonight is Matt O'Neill, an entom entomologist from Iowa State University who has done a considerable amount of research on insect pests and soybeans and other annual crops. And so you can see on the screen here um, that there are, are there's a link to two different research reports. The, the top one there is from Matt's work with ISU, and the bottom one there is with Dick's work with PFI. And I'll be sending those out um, again tomorrow as a follow-up uh, if anybody wants to look through those research reports that we'll be referencing tonight. So I'm going to continue here and do a quick introduction about PFI, and then and then Matt's going to give a brief overview on the history of neonicotinoids before Dick's, Dick talks about his experiences with neonics in northeast Iowa. And then finally, Matt will talk again about his research. So we're going to bounce around a little bit tonight. So we do these just about every Tuesday night during the fall and winter months, roughly between mid-November and mid-March. And um, unfortunately, this is the last one of our winter series. So we'll be starting back up again in November. But the last winter farm in our here means that spring's coming, so that's a good thing. Um, all of our farm in ours are recorded. We've got over a hundred in our archive there, and there's a link to the archive right there. Uh, tons of topics in the archive if you want to go dig through on, when you have some free time. Uh, if you're not familiar with Practical Farmers of Iowa, um, PFI started back in 1985. And we are a, a nonprofit organization made up of farmers and friends of farmers. And the farmers in our organization come from farms of all enterprises, all sizes, and from across the state of Iowa and far beyond the state of Iowa as well. Our mission at PFI is to strengthen farms and communities through farmer led investigation and information sharing. And we use this mission to help farmers practice an agriculture that benefits both the people and the land. And the values at PFI is we value, we welcome everyone. We value creativity, collaboration, and community. We value viable farms now and for future generations, and also stewardship and ecology. So as I mentioned, we are a member-based organization. and. If you're, if you're not a member of Practical Farmers of Iowa, you should definitely consider joining us. <clears throat> Membership allows you to tap into our network of members. You can join our discussion lists. You get, on our, you get our newsletters. You get discounts to our events and the opportunity to participate in PFI research project like Dick Sloan will be talking about later and our beginning farmer programs and all of the, all of the PFI programming. There's a lot of perks for being a PFI member, so you can check that out on the website. Also on our website is the event calendar, which um, right now we're kind of finishing our farm and our season and gearing up for our field day season. So there are a lot of non-PFI events, events on there from our partner organizations. Um, a lot of good stuff to check out. Uh, but stay tuned for the, the PFI field day season, which will be kicking off in May on our members' farms all across the state. And again, you know, check the website for all that info. So a little bit of housekeeping real quick. Um, <clears throat> it looks like most of you got it figured out here. We like people to enter their location into the chat box. We collect that info for just grant reporting purposes. And if you want to help guide the topics for next season's farm and ours and provide some feedback about tonight, then please give us your email address so we can stay in touch. Um, down in the bottom left corner of your screen there, there's a little poll that we ask you to take that just helps us track how many people are tuning in. So if there's a couple of people watching from your one connection, let us know so we can report that. And then um, tonight we've got two presenters that will be going back and forth, but we will save the final 30 minutes or so for questions. So um, think of your questions as we go along. 
Uh, if your question pertains to the topic that we are discussing at the moment, go ahead and throw it in the chat box. Otherwise, hang on to that and we'll, we'll answer your questions at the final, final 30 minutes. So, um, so now I'm going to pull up uh, Matt O'Neill's brief introduction about uh, the history of neonicotinoid seed treatment. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Great, great. Um, so I'm Matt O'Neill. I'm a associate professor at Iowa State University, and I've got an appointment in research and teaching. And most of my research has been on the uh, management of insect pests and soybeans, their ecology, biology, and be honest, just different ways to kill them. Uh, so I'm going to give a brief rundown of the history of neonicotinoid insecticides because that's been one of the insecticide classes uh, that I've worked with in the past uh, 12 years that I've been in Iowa State. Okay, so here we go. Uh, for 10 points and a shot at the bonus round, see if you can answer this question. What is a neonicotinoid? Is it A, the most commonly used pesticide in the world? B, an insecticide with systemic properties? C, a broad spectrum insecticide with activity against pests of crops, ornamental plants, cattle, and pets. Or D, all of the above. Please write down your answer on the back of a dollar bill and send it off to 117 Insectary at Iowa State University. Okay, that's a joke. Uh, Steve kind of laughed. But seriously, this is a serious question. Um, which of these is true? Just a little follow-up here. Uh, Systemic means an insecticide that moves through the plant, uh, and broad spectrum means that it kills pretty much any pest, any insect that it comes in contact with. And if you want to play along, maybe you could type your answer here in the chat box. Well, Peter says B, D, Dick Sloan says D. Anybody else? C, a couple of D's. Well, the, uh, the majority here have it. All three of those are correct. Or, I'm sorry, all three, A, B, and C, are correct. So D, all of the above, is the correct answer. Let's go through these, uh, maybe one by one. Um, the most commonly used pesticide in the world. In uh, a recent summary of insecticide use uh, in a couple of different uh, places around the world, Japan, California, Sweden, and Britain uh, showed that in terms of tons of active ingredient, uh, neonicotinoids are one of the most commonly used insecticides in the world. And that use has increased as you can see in the figure here, almost exponentially, beginning in 1992 when uh, the first commercial uh, version of neonicotinoids were made available. Neonicotinoids are systemic, and this is a remarkable trait because they can move through a plant. And so uh, this has uh, been something that uh, industry, agribusiness has taken advantage of by putting them as a coating on seeds. And from 2000 to 2012, as noted in a paper that just came out from some entomologists at Penn State, John Took, uh, Maggie Douglas and John Tooker, they note that virtually all neonicotinoids applied to maize, soybeans, and wheat were applied as a seed treatment. So neonicotinoids are not the only pesticide put on a seed. Uh, fungicides are also applied, and in soybeans, um, uh, fungicides and uh, recently nematicides have been applied. But both of these, both corn and soybeans, and as well as wheat, uh, have um, are sold with a coating of, neonic of a neonicotinoid. They're also a broad spectrum insecticide. Uh, they have toxicity both in terms of contact toxicity, uh, but their greatest uh, form of toxicity comes, toxicity comes when they are ingested. And when ingested, they can kill a variety of insects from uh, 
uh, plant suckers like aphids to chewers like beetles and caterpillars and to a variety of other insects uh, like mites um, that uh, show up in a variety of areas. And again, as you can see in this figure here, um, there's been an exponential increase in their use, with most of that being in crop use, the kind of orange kind of orange color here is uh, the bulk of this figure and crop chemicals that would be corn, soybean, wheat. Uh, but there is a, a substantial amount, a small but substantial amount used in turf and ornamental, garden, lawn, animal care. And when we look at just the crop chemical use, um, that varies a bit, but uh, the majority uh, has been in corn and most recently in soybeans with a, a smaller percentage in cotton, fruits, vegetables, orchards, and grapes. Uh, these smaller percentages is typically in dr uh, drenches or in foliar applied versions, but for wheat, cotton, or I'm sorry, wheat, soybean, and maize, that's mostly seed applied. And for just soybeans, uh, it was in uh, 2004 and 5 when these became available for use in the United States. So neonicotinoid is a class of insecticide of which there are many uh, different individual compounds. Imidacloprid uh, or gaucho in its commercial form uh, was one of the first that was approved uh, initially on a crisis exemption, a section 18 crisis exemption from the EPA in part because of the concern for bean pod monovirus. So if you see the little uh, green arrow here, this is uh, healthy looking soybeans, but then uh, these seeds over here have the bl uh, bled bleded hilum that comes from bee pod monovirus infected plants. Oh, back in the uh, early 90, late 90s and early 2000s, Many producers in Iowa were reporting infections and losses due to this, and uh, this spurred the uh, creation of a Section 18 crisis exemption, which permitted the use in soybeans in Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and parts of, and, and I believe in Illinois as well. Full approval came in 2005. Uh, Thiomethoxam, uh, full approval came in 2004. This is Cruiser, uh, and this is one of the more commonly used uh, seed treatments neonicotinoids as a seed treatment. So that's, I think, the majority of what we're going to talk about today, uh, those seed treatments in soybeans. And I think at this point, I can pass it back over to Dick to talk about his experience with that. And then I'll come back and share some of our research that we've done at Iowa State University uh, over the past uh, 10 years or so on the usefulness uh, of these uh, insecticides and some of their costs and benefits. How's that? Dick, you ready? I'm ready. A little bit of dead air here while the slides get brought up. Yeah, I think we're ready to go whenever you are, Dick. Okay, well, uh, as Steve had said earlier, why I'm Dick Sloan, and I farm in Buchanan County up in northeast Iowa. So I call it the southwest corner of northeast Iowa. If you go down from the northeast corner of the state, you go over three counties and down three, and, and that's Buchanan County. So not, we're pretty close. But um, I'm in the uh, Cedar River Basin, the middle Cedar River Basin, and that's one of the areas that the uh, state has identified as a project area for the nutrient reduction strategies. I've been involved in watershed work since 2006 um, when the Iowa, ISU extension um, was encouraged and the Iowa corn growers encouraged us to form a, uh, a project group. The farmers formed the Lime Creek Watershed Improvement Association and um, we, we have a website out there, um, I think it's at WordPress, so um, that would be probably part of how you would search for Lime Creek Watershed and WordPress and you'd probably find the right one. So there's a lot of research that we've done over the years there um, and then that's also led me to be involved in the 
as a steering committee member of the Cedar River Watershed Coalition. Um, so in that case, it was had to do with uh, what, what we could do as farmers to try and um, prevent flooding, if possible, um, ways to make our farmland um, slower to fire the water right off, maybe make it more absorbent and richer. And so that experience, uh, in part, <laughs> and the uh, idea of building organic matter in my soil uh, led me into learning to grow cover crops. And so that's how I got involved with Practical Farmers. And so I've also been involved in the Iowa Learning Farms uh, with uh, as a partner, farmer partner with them. Uh, I've had a number of field days on the farm showing people everything from waterways and contours to prairie strips, cover crops, and what I've adopted is uh, in a NRCS soil health package, trying to keep plants alive on the ground all the time, keep the ground covered, uh, do as little tillage as I can, and grow as many different types of crops as I can. So uh, the field you're looking at is a field that I grew soybeans on in 2014 and um, was, uh, let's see, yeah, I think I did have strips in this field that we tested because I've got a flag out there in my field. And, and so uh, that's the best way to keep track of the strips out here. Um, but the date this picture was taken was May 18th, and the field had been planted on May 6th. Uh, you can see how it stripes the field uh, when the uh, no-till drill goes crossways of the old corn rows, and the rye is still live here. Um, I'll, I'll get into more of the how I produce things as we go along and stuff, but uh, I guess my experience farming started in 1978. Um, at that point, my seed coatings on um, corn seed was already common. Um, fungicides and insecticides were uh, available at that time to protect seedlings from blights and pests until the corn plants could be well established. Uh, at that time, back in northeast Iowa, we were planting corn about May 10th. We didn't really want it to be out of the ground to, uh, if we had a hard freeze while we were concerned about the growing points in those days. Uh, we also didn't start planting soybeans until the middle of May and considered early June to be uh, a good time to, to plant soybeans. So. Um, the soils were warmer. Uh, we didn't uh, really need to use uh, fungicides and insecticides on the seedlings, um, on the seeds of soybeans. Um, if you lost some individual seedlings, uh, as long as you had a 100,000 pilot population reasonably well distributed in the field, you really uh, aren't going to affect the yield greatly. Uh, we had uh, strains chosen to resist Phytophthora. Um, but if you had to replant a wet spot, it really wasn't a huge expense. Um, but by the 2000s, we pushed plant populations higher and planting dates were earlier. And so here we were planting soybeans in colder um, soils. It may take longer to get out of the ground, um, but we were trying to get a lot of ground covered. and. So seedlings sometimes faced a tougher environment, and there was more expensive to replant when we were planting these expensive genetically modified seeds that farmers have adopted so strongly since the uh, since they came out a couple of decades ago now, I think. Um, so at winter grower meetings uh, in the, you know, 10 years or so ago, I suppose, why we saw slides of soybeans grown from seeds that were treated with these new fungicide and insecticide seed coatings next to untreated soybeans. And uh, the treated plants looked a lot bigger to us in the meeting. And we were making good profits from the higher yields we were producing and, and pretty good grain prices. And many of us adopted uh, new seed treatments uh, mostly to uh, protect the, the yields that we had at the time and stuff. So go to the next slide here. Um, but about uh, the time that I was starting to adopt some of the soil health practices, why um, the uh, alarms were starting to be sounded about in the 2013 that 
some of these products we were using were having some harmful side effects in the environment. Um, specifically, the talc we'd use for seed lubrication in corn planters was carrying some of the insecticides off. And since talc's uh, similar size to the pollen, uh, it get caught in the flowers and harm uh, and caused some harm to native pollinators. Um, that was probably my first awareness, I guess, of the potential injuries that that neonicotinoids do, could do in the environment. Um, so I was even uh, about that same time because I, my water quality work, I became aware of ISU's strips project um, at the Neil Smith Prairie, and uh, so I'd adopted uh, planting some native prairie strips. I think there's like 31 different species of native prairie. Uh, this is a, a view where you can actually see a uh, monitor that's out there in the prairie strips that's uh, able to listen for uh, what kind of birds are living in the in the environment out there. So I suppose now they're catching the killdeer as they circle overhead out there. So uh, that's a way to try to identify it, how we can um, protect uh, the environment so that as we're losing our, our fence rows and stuff, maybe we can actually put something back in the environment that would uh, do better than a, a fence row that's full of brome or weeds if you round up the guy got too close to the edge and some things. So. But also, some of these native pollinators might even be able to increase my soybean yields. And so I was interested in that. I thought, oh, that, that could be another way that these would pay off, as well as the CRP payment. So anyway, Matt, uh, that fall in 2013, then Matt came to our cooperators conference down to the uh, practical farmers meeting. And he started to explain what some of these issues were. And uh, so uh, a group of us decided that we needed to really test out, uh, compare, since uh, we couldn't find corn seed that was going to be available that to test uh, naked seed with with uh, treated seed. We decided it would be safer for us as farmers to use uh, to question the use of the soybean um, soybean seed coatings that contain the neonicotinoids. So, um, not to jump to conclusions, but uh, I guess it's well advertised. Uh, that uh, I didn't get any re yield response over a couple of years' time. Um, I, what I compared was a full treatment with uh, an inoculant alone. The inoculant cost about uh, $4.50 an acre, where the um, full coating was $13 and a quarter. Some of this, if I don't have it quite right, It'll be in that uh, report that PFI had put out. So um, in uh, 2014, I ran uh, the study on two different sites, but I only had three comparisons uh, in the in the uh, sites, and so I had a larger, least significant difference, and it was more difficult to tell whether I really measured anything significant. Uh, so I, as part of learning to be a better researcher through uh, practical farmers. Why well, I repeated the trial again in 2015 with two different fields, but I had five side-by-side side comparisons and, and had them uh, uh, toss the coin up in the air for each each side-by-side uh, side so that I could get a random replicated uh, trial to meet some of the standards that PFI has encouraged us to attain. So. Uh, to tell you something about my rotation, uh, this field is be just before uh, I was going to plant soybeans, and uh, you can see I no-till corn into into corn ground, and I use the cover crops. I like uh, to use two years of corn in my rotations for quite a few years. I always felt that two years away from soybeans, I would have a lot better soybean yields. Um, some of the disease pressure that that soybeans might have on an every other year cycle um, could be alleviated by having a second year of corn. Um, by having, I don't get into uh, some of the room, room rotations. Uh, I kind of break up the idea of that one that uh, overwinters 
an extra year or sleeps an extra year and it pops up in the corn again. Um, I do use an insecticide or a uh, genetically modified trait corn to control rootworms just in the corn on corn year. So I'm kind of using it, but using it in a rotation with uh, my diverse diversity of crops and stuff. So I uh, do like that uh, I get a lot of carbon from having corn on corn, uh, adding a lot of carbon to the surface of the soil. Um, and then that's <laughs> that's a plus and it's a minus. You kind of learn to use it. Uh, having the high soil biology that uh, healthy soils can produce by having a crop growing constantly and having a diversity of microbes and, and bugs and critters and all the things that live in the soil, uh, the worms and, and everything, why that helps uh, process that extra carbon and, and keep the soil uh, workable. So uh, this is a little zeroed in then on the cover crop mix that I, I took this photo just this last fall. Um, so this field will go into soybeans then this spring. And what I have here is uh, an aerially seeded mix of rye, oats, wheat, and rapeseed. And uh, the pounds were 60 pounds of rye, 15 pounds of oats, 10 of wheat, and 5 pounds of rapeseed. So some of the taller ones are some oats. Uh, the smaller ones, the rye and the wheat tend more being winter grains, winter small grains, they'll tend to be more uh, uh, low growing and develop, do some tillering and stuff in the fall, but they don't put on a lot of height. And then the rapeseed is to add some diversity, give me a, a brassica out there to add to the so that was where I had it flown on. If uh, I have to drill a field, though, it's too late by the time I would harvest to be able to um, drill a mix like this. The oats wouldn't uh, be able to get the kind of growth that they do if you get them put on in uh, very early September or even August. And so I would drill fields to 60 pounds of rye, 15 pounds of triticale, and 15 pounds of wheat. So then it's spring and it's time to this photo I took with my uh, my cell phone and so it's not quite the, the quality but um, I plant into uh, green covers with my soybeans. Um, I had bought a drill in 2012 to seed cover crops and I can either plant it, uh, plant rows in seven and a half inch rows or 15 inch rows and the research shows that the narrow row of soybeans uh, lead to a quicker canopy. Uh, so uh, as long as I had the drill, I was going to make sure I used it for my soybean crop too to try to lower the cost of a fairly expensive piece of machinery. I do have uh, guidance steering on the GPS guidance steering. It's not an RTK system, but it works pretty well with this tractor and, and uh, drill combination. It takes a lot of the pressure off. You don't have to figure out where you're at in the field once you get started. Why uh, you can kind of look back more than you look forward as long as you're looking forward at the right times and stuff. So, uh, also, I like to be able to plant corn and soybeans at the same time in the spring. Uh, I have a friend that can plant the soybeans for me while I'm planting corn, and uh, that way we can deal with some of the narrower planting windows that seem to be developing across the Midwest. Uh, this is actually a screenshot from the Versa, Ag Leader Versa um, planting monitor. Um, I'll grab the arrow and kind of describe the field here a little bit. The, uh, when we started out, um, we went across the field to mark off a line. And we were, uh, it was on the 28th of April of 15. And so we planted uh, the blue strips first, I guess, instead of the red strips. <laughs> Look at my, my, my picture here and figure it out. But um, once we had established a route, why then um, we just flipped the coin. And I came up heads four times in a row before I finally came up with tails. So we at the, at the north end of the plot, 
you can see there's actually a strip here of red and blue and then a strip of blue and red and then this we just planted the rest of the red uh, untreated seed when we were planting that out after the second day we filled in the strips and stuff so um, when I did harvest this field uh, I split the field in half uh, across north and south so that the way wagon down on this end of the field uh, could sit here and I could go make my rounds with the uh, combine. What I do when I harvest is to split the field in the middle of the middle uh, comparison and um, put a half of a head of each type of seed through in order to split the field and then discard that into a wagon and then I can make a round on each on the red and I can make a round on the blue and then I can make a round that splits the middle again and discard that to weigh and then keep working my way out across the field and so that's how I can keep the uh, way wagon busy at one end of the field and uh, going with a combine across half mile rows would have been too time consuming and I was already um, happy to have my dealers help in evaluating uh, I guess uh, I didn't mention it but um, uh, five passes with the drill is what we would have to plant so that we'd have a 75 foot strip and then that works with the three passes of the combine. And so. Some of this stuff is all stuff that you learn at practical farmers when you go to the cooperators conference. So they do a real good job. Have to have to approve of everything. Um, this is a, let's see, this is a field um, 10 days after planting and that's the field we were just looking at um, so on April this was planted then uh, at the end of April it was April 23rd before plant so a week or so before planting we applied two pints of Prowl H2O and one pint of LV4 it's a form of 24 d and that would clean out and uh, it would give me some residual um, for early weeds and it would also um, kill out any uh, resistant water or uh, roundup resistant mares tail that might be in the field uh, if there are groups three and four herbicides um, then on April 28th to 30th we planted the field to soybeans and then uh, May 8th uh, took this photo after a rain while I'd been out scouting. So um, the soybeans in this one are, are shown coming up uh, on May 27th. Uh, it had been May 21st before the uh, I got the Roundup applied. I used uh, 40 ounces of Durango, so that's the Group Nine. Roundup uh, type product that I had uh, the soybeans already merged. There might be a little, a few spots that you can see on a few of the plants that uh, kind of make me think. Well, I was like, well, that might have been some burn even from going in. Um, where I might like to get it on a little sooner, the way I had the previous year, I have to deal with uh, wet conditions sometimes. Um, uh, soybeans seem to be able to withstand this early competition pretty well. Um, the uh, you can kind of see that uh, the stand is slightly uh, not the, the most. It's the diff. It's difficult to get a uh, if you, there's a a pretty good row running along here. There's a row running along here, and then kind of a gap, and then a seed then that tries to struggle. Uh, another place where you could see that where the things went through but there's a few beans missing um, I plant about 150,000 this year and uh, I did have a field where we checked the stand later and I still had 140,000 but I'm not sure in this spot I did but I still seem to have pretty good yields um, does it's a uh, it's tough getting through all that residue and, and really doing a good job and, and uh, dealing with the weather. Uh, that's just part of what we deal with in, uh, in farming, though. That wouldn't be too much different with, uh, without the cover crops if we were working with that much residue. 
Um, this field shows uh, some of my rough fields that I used in 15-inch rows. This was a photo that was it was taken about June 29th, then of uh, 19 or of 2014. Uh, not quite as old as that, <laughs> but uh, so June 29th, uh, and we all know what happens June 21st, right? Soybeans gonna start flowering. The days are gonna get shorter, so we need to try to get our canopy out there. Uh, I do like having the, the solid stand um, soybeans. Um, so uh, for a, 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 with a uh, residual and burn down combination then that I was putting on in June, it'd be late June, I would end up getting on a, a three pint of Flexstar GT and a pint of Warrant. So I'm using groups 9, 14, and 15 um, applied in late June uh, to keep my fields uh, clean. The trouble with this is that um, the Flexstar and the Warrant really need to be applied in May. There's actually a four-month recrop restriction for wheat, rye, and barley. Um, I'm not selling wheat, rye, and barley. I'm using it on my own farm when I grow it. Um, it's not a big thing, but I might also indicate that they'd be herbicides we should use earlier so that we don't have trouble with uh, establishment of cover crops in the fall. So my plan would be to try and put the Flexstar and Warrant on as a burn down in May and try to get, um, get the control of any of the uh, uh, Roundup resistant or uh, some of the other herbicide resistance issues that we might be facing in uh, commercial agriculture under control, but, but um, still be able to grow cover crops and, and not have trouble with uh, seeds that you spend money on, on seeds to grow something and then you end up suffering. So Then this would be a field that I had for a test site in 2015 and it was seeded in seven half inch rows. And this was in August 26th. And the uh, cover crops, I think, uh, have really helped uh, weed control, especially those small seeded annuals, such as the water hemp. Um, I still do use a, a pretty strong herbicide package along with the cover crops, but uh, I have really clean fields too, so. And the final, one of those final shots here, we've got the harvest time going across that field. You can see how when you have uh, narrow rows, it's pretty tough to look out ahead with your combine and say, okay, I have a flag at this end of the field, but where do these rows go? So you, you try to figure out how to have that marked out. It's uh, It can be a real tangle when you have waist deep beans that you're trying to figure out where's the row direction to split the field for a for a farm study but uh, seem to have gotten along pretty good with that so yeah well I guess I'm zipping along here to my next slide um, Steve has already uh, marked out that he's going to mail everybody a copy of the uh, research reports that are on the website. Uh, if you want to go to practical far practicalfarmers.org and get to the uh, research reports that are on the website and do a search on Neonic, there's uh, I think only two of them pop up. So it's not hard to use the search engine on the Practical Farmers website to find the information too. So um, basically uh, I have become more confident now that uh, it's a good way to hold my costs down to uh, just avoid use of the neonicotinoids on my soybean seeds. Um, I've, I've pretty well satisfied myself that uh, it's not a fluke one year type of a thing. I think it might be a fluke if they if they did pay at this point. So um, there are uh, a lot of other studies that 
uh, have been similar results that a scientists have had, and I'm sure that uh, Matt will be happy to talk to us about some of that, um, give us an idea about uh, ways that uh, we might be able to control pests by using a better IPM system and using integrated pest management um, instead of using fungicides routinely and then ending up with issues of, gee, why don't these fungicides work uh, if we only use them when we need them or we use them in the right place. Uh, the same thing with our insecticides. Um, my soil health package that I'm trying to implement is trying to achieve a lot of diversity so that I have a diversity of insects and microbes and, and things, arthropods, different things living in my, in my soil. Um, that way, when I do have a pest, there might be several predators to that pest that are living out there in my field along with them and can naturally take over. Uh, if I've got a, a field where I'm so very hell-bent on killing everything out there and thinking the only thing I want out there is the, the crop that I'm raising, well, you're creating a lot of opportunities for pests to establish themselves on your farm too. So um, I think there's a... Uh, there's a lot more beneficial insects out there than, than guys realize. Um, uh, some of the studies in a lot of different places throughout the Midwest are, are saying that if we can um, not overuse some of these um, strong arm techniques on our, on our crops, that maybe we can be better off in the long run. So, um, I, I have to say I was... Uh, able to talk with Matt one time through our work together on a sustainablecorn.org project. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we were, Excuse me. Um, anyway, uh, at uh, sustainablecorn.org, if you go to that website, uh, we've just finished up uh, a five-year uh, multi-state uh, study that uh, looking to find ways to um, make our crop production systems more resilient in the face of global climate change. And um, when we had talked about his speaking at the Practical Farmers meeting in 2013, he said he'd given that meeting, that same talk to a, a lot of different farmer groups, but Practical Farmers were the only ones who really felt like we should be concerned about the environmental side effects of some of these products that are out there. So um, I think perhaps now that it's becoming clearer that these products don't really provide a good return on investment, that a lot of fellow farmers will really evaluate, really be interested in evaluating whether their use is warranted on their own farms. So with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Matt and see what else he has to teach us. How about now? Can you hear me now? Okay, so I yep. should go till about 10 after you said? Okay, um, great. Uh, thanks, uh, Dick, uh, for the transition. And I got to say, I won't have as uh, nice of pictures as uh, you had of your farm. Uh, mine are going to be pretty, uh, uh, pretty bland compared to that. Uh, so what I want to do is uh, run you guys through, guys and gals, uh, through uh, a study that I did with a graduate student back in about, two starting in 2005, where we compared management approaches for the soybean aphid. This was around the time that the aphid had, had just kind of spread throughout North America, and we were trying to come up with ways to keep it in check. So the focus of my talk is going to be on the soybean aphid as the target pest. and. Uh, the aphid is a phloem feeder, and that's how it causes its injury to the plant. And if enough aphids get on the plant, they will uh, produce so much, uh, they, will, they will feed on so much of the phloem that they'll exude uh, honeydew out of the back end that will coat the plant. And then that acts as a substrate for sooty mold that you see here, that dark color on these leaves. And then the white flecks here are the cast skins from the aphids as they molt. And if populations allow to grow unchecked, 
uh, we've seen about a 25% yield reduction in Iowa across our many experiments. And at the time that I produced the slide set, this would have been in uh, 2008, uh, 2007, 2008, um, we estimated a possible economic loss of about $163 per acre, assuming 65 bushels to the acre and $10 uh, per bushel of soybeans. I think we're well below that now. Uh, last I looked, I think we were a little below $8 a bushel. So these estimates are a bit off. But the point is, when an outbreak occurs, there is a potential for yield loss from the soybean aphid. And this is a picture of the aphid. Uh, if you look up close on the plant, you can see them. Uh, these are the little nymphs, the adult here. And then a few uh, develop wings. And they can colonize a field. And if left unchecked, their populations can grow quite quickly, uh, doubling in ideal conditions under uh, under ideal conditions in less than two days. So, how can we manage aphids uh, with insecticides? What's the best way to do this? Well, in general, I think there's two approaches. One is a prophylactic approach. That is, use insecticides um, before the aphid or before the pest shows up, or whether or not the pest is there in uh, large enough, uh, whether you know the de the uh, population of the uh, insect. So prophylactically, we can do this in two ways. We can apply insecticide to the seed, that is uh, seed treatments, or we can apply them to the foliage, uh, foliar applied insecticides, either alone or in tank mixes with other pesticides. So sometimes farmers will throw in, um, say, uh, when they're applying Roundup to their soybeans, they might throw in um, a small amount of uh, insecticide or maybe even fungicide. And if the pests aren't there, this is a prophylactic way of applying those. An alternative approach is, I think what Dick was hinting at, is IPM, or integrated pest management. That is, applying a pesticide when the pest is at risk for, produce, for reducing yield. So this involves two steps. Scouting, to know what pest is there and whether there's enough of it to really warrant the insecticide. And then using a threshold to determine if it uh, is at a level that needs to be treated. So before we did all the experiments here, we had already established a, a scouting protocol and a threshold, an economic threshold for the soybean aphid at 250 per plant. And we'll be using that uh, when we think about the different treatments we're going to apply uh, in this experiment. So I sent the manuscript out. I think uh, I sent it to Steve. Um, you all should be able to get a copy of that to read the real details. Uh, I'm going to just highlight a couple of them, uh, of the details, and then show you the results. So the title of the paper uh, was Probability of Cost-Effective Management of the Soybean Aphid. And in it, we worked with, we tested four methods. Uh, it sounds like, Dick, you did two of those. You had an, uh, an untreated control. So we had an untreated control where we used no insecticides. We used a herbicide as needed. Uh, but no insecticides. Then we compared that to a prophylactic approach, an insecticide and a fungicide applied to foliage when the soybeans flowered. So we did this whether the, uh, uh, the pests were there or not, it was, so it's prophylactic. We also used a seed treatment. So this was just cruiser, just thiomethoxam only. Right? It's also prophylactic, but in this case, it's only the seed applied insecticide, no foliar insecticide. And finally, we did an IPM approach. We scouted and we applied as needed using that 250 aphid per plant threshold. So those are the four methods that we compared in a study conducted by colleagues at three states over three years. And the three, uh, so the three treat, those four treatments uh, had insecticides applied, as shown here in this table. Control had none. The preventative had a pyrethroid plus a fungicide. Now, the reason we did this is at the time that we were doing the study, not only were soybean aphids a problem, but there was a concern for soybean rust. It had just been detected in Florida, and soybean farmers around the Midwest were concerned that this fungal pathogen was going to be blown up into the United, uh, in, further north into the United States. So we combined pyrethroid and a fungicide, uh, pyrethroid being insecticide and fungicide together, and again applied that at flower. We did our pyrethroid uh, insecticide for our IPM treatment, the same one that was used in the prophylactic or preventative approach. 
and then the C treatment was a neonicotinoid, in this case, cruiser, thiamethoxam, and it was applied uh, before, before planting so that it's there on the seed. So those are the four treatments. And the question was, which of those four was the best? So we did this in uh, what's called a randomized complete block design. We had six. So in each, uh, each location we did this experiment, we had the four treatments. And each of those treatments was replicated six times. So, you know, and the plot sizes varied from about a tenth of an acre to a quarter of an acre. Again, the details are in the manuscript. We did this in three years, 2005, 6, and 7. And we had participants in three states, Iowa, Universe, uh, Michigan State University, and University of Minnesota. And each of us picked two locations in our state to conduct this experiment. What that looks like uh, is shown here in this map. Uh, we had a location in central Iowa, uh, just uh, south of campus in Story County. And then we had uh, uh, some fields in Sheraton, Iowa, uh, in uh, Lucas County. And we had colleagues in uh, Minnesota and Michigan helping us as well. So in this table, if you look at the larger manuscript, we uh, have the locations, the planting dates, which is important for the seed treatment because that gives you some idea of how long that seed treatment has to last, uh, the timing for the prophylactic spraying of the fungicide and insecticide, and the IPM spraying. And right away, you should be able to see a big difference here in these three approaches. One, the prophylactic was applied every year at every location. It's prophylactic. You do it whether it's needed or not. The IPM, we're scouting, and we're only applying as needed. So you can see here that many of the years, many of the locations, we didn't apply. There were some that got applied frequently, uh, like we saw applications in Minnesota occurring in Redwood uh, in uh, each of the years that we did the experiment, but in Story County, only one of the years did we need to spray based on our threshold and scouting. So I'm going to show you the data now for just Story County, because I think it's most relevant to uh, the experience that Dick had, maybe the best comparison. And in our first year, we didn't have seed treatment yet when the experiment went out, so we just compared our control, our untreated, to that prophylactic spraying and then the IPM approach. And in 2005, in terms of yield, bushels per acre, we saw no significant difference between, uh, among those treatments. In 2006, we had enough seed treatment to uh, use in our experiment, and we saw no difference among the treatments. So here we have the untreated control, the prophylactic, the insecticide and fungicide applied at flowering, the IPM, and then the seed treatment. And although there's some variation amongst these, statistically, no difference in yield across those treatments. In 2007, now we saw some statistical significance in our treatments. So the previous slides are consistent with what Dick's uh, experience was and his experiment. 2007, our lowest yield was in the control. The prophylactic and IPM were statistically similar, although numerically a little bit higher with the prophylactic application of insecticide. But the seed treatment was intermediary. So we saw some, it looks like we saw some yield protection from the seed treatment, but not as good as just applying the insecticides to the foliage. And let's see, the next slide here shows all three years combined from uh, all, uh, all locations. So not just Story County. And what you see is that the untreated control had our lowest uh, across all these uh, locations. But statistically significant were the yields from the prophylactic, the IPM, and the seed treatment. Now, before you walk away from this thinking, oh, you always have to spray insecticide, be aware that the IPM treatment was not always applied. It was only applied as needed. And so there were times where the control was in a fit location where insecticide probably needed to be sprayed. We, we had an aphid outbreak, but we didn't spray it. And we likely lost some yield. Well, we did across all, when we combine all the data together. So why is that? What is that source of variation? Well, we were scouting for our, um, uh, for the aphid 
as one to determine whether we needed to spray an insecticide or not. And from Story County, this is just the uh, aphid data from Story County, you can see the year-to-year -year variation. So the y-axis here is mean aphids per plant. This picture shows you how we're collecting that data. We're going out and we're looking at the aphids on the plant uh, in the field. We started scouting in June, well before the aphid was there, and then ended in August, long after uh, uh, maybe the populations had declined, just to make sure we accounted for everything that was there. And you can see across these three lines the year-to-year -year variation. And note that this dotted line is our economic threshold. So in 2005, few if any aphids uh, until we get late into August. In 2006, very hard to find an aphid, very, very few aphids. Uh, some places were basically aphid free. But in 2007, we had a remarkable outbreak that exceeded the threshold in July and went well into the thousands per plant into August. And this is, and you know, in 2007, this is what we would see on some of our plants. So many aphids on the leaves that they were crowded on the stems as well. So I want to uh, get a little uh, technical with you, uh, and this is going to be helpful to help us understand the relationship between aphids and yield. So we're going to talk about cumulative aphid days. What I just showed you was the aphids per, pl per plant. Oh, lost my little pointer. So in this figure, uh, we have aphids per plant on the y-axis, and then date. And you get this jumbled mess. Cumulative aphid days takes what uh, this data and makes it more simple so that we can understand the full exposure of the plant to aphids. So what does that look like? Well, think of it this way. It's a way to visualize these treatment differences. It's analogous to degree days in that the plant, we're measuring the plant's exposure to aphids. That exposure can never be taken away. So 10 aphids over 10 days, 100 cumulative aphid days. The more aphids over a set period of time, the more cumulative aphid days. So that exposure goes up, it can never go down. Oh, So what you're seeing here in table four is the cumulative aphid days for all locations and treatments from our experiment. And so this large number uh, here represents a lot of exposure of the plant to aphids. And statistically, we had about five-fold less in the prophylactic and, the, uh, and about three-fold less in the IPM. And these letters represent the uh, that statistical significance is occurring amongst those treatments. In 2006, when we had very, very few aphids, notice these low numbers. These are remarkably low. And statistically, we can still see that these treatments are different, but very, very low difference here, very, very low exposure, and very no effect across those uh, when it comes to tr uh, yield. In 2007, the year where it got kind of the most interesting, we had our control at a fair amount of aphids across all locations, the highest. The prophylactic and the C treatment had the lowest, and the IPM was an intermediary, in part because we, were, we allowed some exposure to the plant to those aphids while we're scouting, waiting for that 250 threshold to uh, be reached before we sprayed. And in terms of yield, no difference. Now David A. Uh, had asked a question, did we do a cost analysis to get a return per uh, our acre for our investment? And in, in fact we did. I'm going to skip ahead here to um, this figure, this or this table, table six. So we did a probability analysis. We asked what's the probability that we're going to get back um, our investment in terms of the cost to apply the uh, pesticide? And unfortunately, in the scientific papers, everything's in metrics. So probability per soybean uh, price per 27.2 kilograms, that's one bushel. Uh, and we, uh, so the probability of getting, uh, what this is, is the probability of getting back what we spent on the insecticides um, per one bushel of soybeans. And that can vary uh, by price. So you've got a price range of 6, 8, 10, and 12. And we looked at our treatments, and in terms of uh, scouting costs, we estimated, well, whether you, you apply it on your own or uh, you scout on your own, or maybe you ask a, a co-op or a consultant to do it for you. So that contributes to the IPM costs. Prophylactic, it's all in the insecticide and the application. 
and you can look to the uh, the manuscript to see what those actual costs were. I think they're in range with what Dick was talking about earlier for seed treatments. I don't think that change uh, has changed too much. But what you can see here in, in these probabilities is that regardless of the price, let's just take eight dollars here because that's about where we're at right now. Um, but regardless of the price, the IPM, the probability of us getting back what we invested, is higher than in the others. And that is a function of using pesticides under an IPM approach when they're needed and then when they're not. Whereas with the prophylactic and the seed treatment, we're using those whether they're needed or not. And so our likelihood of gaining back that cost declines. And the greater the value of the crop, the, uh, the higher the probability of getting that back but as we get into a period uh, or a range of lower price per bushel, the less likely we are to, to recoup that cost. So some overall like points from that experiment. Uh, prophylactic approach had the lowest aphid populations because every year we're spraying, again, whether we needed to or not. We didn't see any difference, though, in yield protection among the seed treatment, that prophylactic or IPM approach. And therefore, a single application of a foliar insecticide was the most efficient use of insecticide, using it only when it's needed. And this experiment that I showed you was from a time period of 2005, 6, and 7. My colleague, Aaron Hodgson, uh, continues to do insecticide evaluations, looking at new products and, and um, existing products. And if you didn't see you know, in terms of a pyrethroid or a thiamethoxam and a pesticide that you're familiar with, I invite you to go to the, uh, her website or go to our, our extension website to download what's called the Yellow Book, which is the summary of her insecticide evaluations. And what's interesting there is she's been doing this uh, evaluation work uh, <clears throat> for several years. And she shared with me some slides I'm going to show now. This is uh, summarized in some of her yellow books. The aphid abundance, all right, so aphids per plant over a 10 year period. So we did our experiment that I just showed you in 05, 06, and 07, but she's continued to do this kind of work going out to 2014. And from year to year, there's a lot of variation here, all right? But, and, and, uh, what, 2013 was our last real big outbreak, or at least where in her plots she exceeded a threshold. And in her experiments, she's comparing different foliar insecticides applied based on that IPM approach and seed treatments. And she shared with me this slide. So this is, okay, so that's the economic threshold there, right? Those seed treatments, based on how we understand their chemistry and their performance, their expected uh, loss of uh, efficacy is 50 days after planting. So note that if you plant in May, by July, that product, those seed treatments, are no longer offering much protection, which I think helps explain some of Dick's experience with these seed treatments. And when we summarize her data uh, here over a six-year period, or I'm sorry, a uh, five-year period, um, where she had untreated and seed treatments. So the first axis here is a cumulative aphid days, that measure of exposure. Right? And so that's the bars here. And yeah, the seed treatment do provide some protection. Right? But in terms of bushels per acre, they're not providing much in terms of yield protection, at least in her experience, in her experiments. And if you want to uh, see more about that, again, download her uh, yellow book which is an ongoing project that she does to evaluate insecticides for their efficacy against aphids. So it goes beyond just the seed treatments. OK, uh, let's see. So uh, I noticed somebody made a comment in the chat area about the EPA's benefit analysis. So in 20, let's see, this was 2014. Uh, no, yeah, 2014 in uh, the fall of 2014, the EPA published a benefits analysis, and this is straight from the text of that. 
EPA concludes, I'll just read it, that these seed treatments provide little or no overall benefits to soybean production in most situations. Published data indicate that in most cases there is no difference in soybean yield when soybean seed was treated with neonicotinoids versus not receiving any insect control treatment. One of the studies that they cited was that Johnson and O'Neill, uh, or Johnson et al. paper, uh, whose data I just shared with you. Um, they also cited studies from around the Midwest and the South. And part of that is reflected in this statement. They say uh, little or no overall benefit in most situations. Though what they're referring to there is that in the South, they see a, a, a strong uh, body of evidence to suggest that these seed rooms are providing protection for soybean growers in the South. Uh, so this is Louisiana, Mississippi, Georgia, uh, parts of the Carolinas. They have a very different uh, set of pesticides, or a very different set of pests that attack those uh, cro the soybean crops down there. In the Midwest, Minnesota, Iowa, Illinois, um, Wisconsin, Michigan, the need for these seed treatments is not as clear. Uh, Again, similar results from what we saw in our study uh, were reported in the CPA uh, benefits analysis. And if you want to read the whole document, the link is there um, at the bottom of the slide. You can download that and still see it. Okay, so are insecticides, so Dick was hinting this at the end there. Are there other ways to think about soybean aphid management beyond insecticides? Um, I got a few minutes. I just want to plug a couple of projects that my lab is doing uh, with Aaron Hodgson and uh, to some extent with PFI. One of them involves uh, this critter right here. This is a uh, natural enemy of the soybean aphid that is fairly common in the aphid's native range in uh, Asia and China. This is a parasitoid wasp. It's a tiny little wasp that lays its eggs inside the aphid. So you can see this wasp right here. It's about to stick, she's about to stick her ovipositor into this aphid. And after about a week, that egg has hatched, the larvae have fed on the interior of the aphid, and then the adult wasp emerges. There are many different natural enemies, many different predators of the soybean aphid in soybean fields of Iowa. And Dick's efforts to conserve them uh, are, are help the, uh, those predators have an impact, say, on soybean aphids. However, because the aphid is not native to North America, it has escaped these natural enemies that are common in its native range, like these wasps. So with help from the USDA, uh, we have permits now to release a select uh, a limited number of species of these wasps to help establish them in North America so that the aphid can be reunited with this source of mortality. These parasitoids have been screened to be, uh, and, and uh, have been, their host range has been measured so that we know that they're only attacking the soybean aphid and not other aphids. We now have permits to release a specific one this summer called Aphelinus glycinus, and we hope to have the same kind of uh, impact of these wasps in North America as they have in China, where the soybean aphid is not a pest. So that's one way, outside of insecticides, that we could uh, think about maybe improving our management of soybean aphids. Another is here in this uh, little uh, quiz. Our uh, which of, th of these uh, uh, soybeans are aphid resistant? Is it A, the one on the left here, B, the one on the right, or C, is it impossible to tell? So if you, I see somebody's typing, kind of curious if anybody else is. Peter says C, can't tell. Dick says A. Anybody else? B. Also, we got across the board here. Well, um, this is a picture from uh, one of our uh, experiments that we did looking at different varieties of soybeans that have uh, aphid-resistant 
genes bred into them. And what we've found is that this aphid resistance can suppress soybean aphids uh, and in some remarkable ways. So one thing I told you about earlier in the talk was that if aphid populations get heavy enough on a plant, they excrete a lot of honeydew, and that produces a sticky surface for sooty mold to grow. And what you can see here in these two lines is this line of soybeans is dark because it has a large population of aphids on it that has produced that sooty mold. Whereas right next to it is this line of soybeans that are bright green. Uh, they are uh, a, almost aphid free. They have such a low population that they are not experiencing that sooty mold that the soybeans to the, uh, to, right next to them are experiencing. We have, uh, with thanks from USDA and some soybean breeders at the University of Illinois and uh, here at Iowa State, we have some varieties that we have shown in tests across the Midwest, similar to what I just showed you for the seed treatment, that can provide these, that we have aphid resistant varieties that can provide season long protection such that you wouldn't need to use an insecticide. And we're looking for farmer cooperators to help us test this on farm. So, if you're interested in improving soybean aphid management, either through biological control in the form of releasing the wasp or testing these aphid resistant soybeans, if you're interested in either one of these, please contact me. We have opportunities to do releases or to provide uh, seed so that farmers can get a, uh, uh, some opportunities to try different methods for controlling the soybean aphid. And with that, I apologize, Steve. Um, it's 8:12. I went a little bit over. I've got some people to acknowledge uh, and a few other slides if we have time for questions that I might get to, but uh, for the most part, that's everything I wanted to go through. How's that? Ah, that's great. Yeah, definitely no need to apologize. That was really great information. Um, so yeah, maybe now's a good time if anybody has any questions on their mind about any of the stuff that was covered by either Dick or by Matt, please get it in the chat box. We still got about 15 minutes here. Um, so yeah, get your questions in the chat box. Matt does have a couple more slides. If um, if you want him to go uh, continue on a little bit, we can do that. But I um, want to make sure that we got everybody's questions covered. And um, and actually, Matt, there was a question here just a minute ago from Kenny. He said, do you expect the parasitoid to become established in your trials? Uh, I'm going to jump ahead just to that, I think, just that picture. Um, so. That's a great question. Uh, we have tried this in the past with some parasitoid species and found that they did not establish, in part because they were unable to overwinter in Iowa. The species that we have permits for now, Aphelinus glycinus, has been shown to overwinter in Minnesota. Uh, so it has that potential. Um, whether it can uh, withstand uh, our sort of corn soybean dominated landscape of Iowa? I don't know. Uh, that's partly why we're, uh, we're doing this as a, not only a, a release but also an experiment. So one thing we're looking at is does the landscape around the field matter? Uh, we'll, so we've got an experiment going on this summer where we'll release it in uh, soybean farms that are kind of complex landscapes where there's wood lots and uh, pasture nearby and then uh, landscapes that are just completely dominated by corn and soybeans. But a lot of those are research farms. I'd love to be able to do some releases on actual farms going forward. Yeah, thanks, Matt. It looks like Greg has a question that you would probably be best to answer as well. Are there other aphid management methods besides insecticides and releasing wasps? Yeah, I was just typing uh, a response to Greg's uh, answer, so or Greg's question. The uh, aphid resistant varieties work really, really well. Uh, we have tested those uh, in multiple locations and found that uh, when we combine, when we get a variety with two genes, two aphid resistant genes, uh, we're, um, we eliminate the need for insecticide. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of commercial uh, sources of these resistant lines. Um, there are a couple of seed companies that sell them, but mostly to their uh, seed companies that sell to organic soybean growers. So the, the cost of those seeds, because it's certified organic, is 
probably a little bit higher than most people are interested in paying. I don't know, but I'm just saying it's in certified organic seed. Um, one of the things that we hope to do over the next couple of years is demonstrate this to farmers so that we build kind of a bottom-up interest in this, and hopefully uh, industry will uh, pick up on it. How's that? Yeah, that's great. I think that I think that was a good answer. Um, it, and then there's a question here now from Kenny that Matt. I'll just I'll let you even read the question because there's yeah. at least one yeah. word in there I'll stumble on. So uh, Kenny asks, are the resistant soybeans expressing antizenosis or antibiosis? Uh, great question. So antizenosis and antibiosis are different types of uh, resistance. Uh, mechanisms in a plant. Uh, antizenosis just means that uh, the pest doesn't really recognize the plant as a host, uh, either because of the way it smells or looks or whatever. Antibiosis is when there's something toxic in the plant that kills uh, or prevents the insect from fully developing. With our aphid resistance, um, there's evidence for both, but in the lines that we've tested, it's mostly antibiosis. The aphids uh, can find the plant, they'll start feeding, um, but if you force them on it, they'll eventually die off uh, and just kind of peter out over the uh, course of a couple of weeks. And they never really build up to the hundreds or thousands that we see on aphid susceptible plants. Yeah, thank you, Kenny. That was a good, that was a good question. Still got some more time here for questions if anybody's Got something they've been wanting to ask. Um, Dick, uh, I assume you're still there. I don't know if you have any um, questions for Matt or comments about what he talked about or any two cents to offer. I got to say, while Dick is maybe turning his microphone back on, um, my sense is Dick's experiment suggests that he doesn't have an aphid problem. Uh, so uh, one of the things that, you know, if, you're, if you've got farmers who are coming off of a period of time where soybeans were worth a lot of money and they could afford inputs uh, and they were using them, maybe whether they felt they needed to or not, they just they wanted the, the, the insurance, now's a good time to kind of start doing the experiments like what Dick did for your own field, your own uh, area, to know if, if you really have uh, a year-to-year aphid problem that needs a prophylactic approach. There are probably some people in Iowa that, that do have that need, but my guess is it's there are uh, there's a lot of parts in Iowa where the need for a prophylactic approach to manage aphids is, is, isn't necessary. Um, I think the estimate is something like 30 to 40 percent of Iowa soybeans or just soybeans grown in the Midwest are grown with a seed treatment. Uh, if that's being done for soybean aphids, my guess is that's probably too high. Um, but without doing some experiments uh, on your own farm, you, you can't really know. So there's some questions coming in about can you remote image or remote sense aphids? Um, and uh, that's a great question. Right now, no, there isn't. Uh, I do know of a colleague, uh, entomologist at University of Minnesota, Bob Cook, who's exploring how we might use a um, uh, photo imaging uh, attached to drones to detect aphid populations in soybean fields. But I think we're probably four, four years out from that being part of uh, a management approach. Um, oh, uh, Kenny asks a great question. Can you address pest resistant issues with prophylactic applications? Great question. Uh, that is not something that I touched on here, but anytime you use an insecticide year in and year out, um, whether it's needed or not, um, you run the risk of the pest developing resistance. And recently, uh, Bob Cook, the one I just mentioned at University of Minnesota, has found aphid populations in commercial soybean fields in Minnesota that were resistant to uh, foliar, some uh, foliar insecticides. Uh, this isn't widespread, but it is disconcerting that at least in a few locations uh, resistance has developed to the soybean aphid. We haven't seen it in Iowa, and if you look at Aaron Hodgson's yellow book data, 
a lot of the insecticides we're use we're using work really really well now but if we continue to use these prophylactically over a large area we run the risk of developing resistance and a lot of other aphid species have developed resistance to insecticides thank you Kenny and Greg writes do you have any idea about why the aphids were so abundant in that one year but not in others was it weather related uh, a lot of factors can influence aphid abundance uh, aphids do really well in kind of cool dry temperatures uh, if it gets too hot above 90 you can slow down their growth and to some extent just dry, uh, dry, them, uh, dry them out kill them because the temperatures get too hot I think what is driving a lot of our year-to-year -year variation is a predator-prey dynamic. You get a year with a lot of aphids, and even though the predators don't protect the aphids in that year, they do move on to buckthorn and prevent the aphid from overwintering such that the next year we have fewer aphids coming out of buckthorn and we have a lower population. So we've seen, to some extent, a, a high-low, high-low uh, kind of alternating years. Uh, that's not always the case, but uh, there's some evidence that says, suggests that that's being driven by the current crop of natural enemies for, that we have in Iowa. Hopefully, if we get these parasitoids established, we might be able to uh, drive the aphid to a point where it's really not even a pest. I don't know how much more time we have, uh, Steve. Yeah, we we can go up until 8.30, so we've still got a good seven or eight minutes if we need it. Because one of the, I think this was in the original title or uh, of the Farminar today, um, was uh, on sort of the, the negative aspects of neonicotinoids. And I don't have a lot of time to go into this, but I will uh, maybe leave you this um, and and leave it for your uh, your PFI members to explore. There was an article in Science in 2014 uh, that was titled The Trouble with Neonicotinoids. And from that article was this figure. And this uh, figure illustrates the fate of neonicotinoids and pathways of environmental contamination. So I think one of your, uh, one of our listeners noted uh, had a question about plant uptake and if the neonicotinoids make their way to the seed what's interesting is that the author this uh, summarizes a variety of work what's interesting in that summary is that plant uptake of neonicotinoids is is pretty low only about two to twenty percent depending upon the plant uh, species only about two to twenty percent of that neonicotinoid is taken up by the plant the rest is either braided off the plant it plant or off the seed at planting in the form of dust or moves through the soil and there is some concern and there's some evidence that uh, the neonic is found in the plant in maybe nectar and pollen and is uh, leading to exposure for non-target organisms like bees uh, one other concern is this movement through the soil is runoff and the move and, and it and the the discovery that neonicotinoids have been found in surface water. What impact they're having, we don't know, uh, I don't think yet, but it is, again, disconcerting that uh, these products are finding their way off of the plant and in places where uh, we didn't intend them to be. So this is driving a lot of the discussion about neonicotinoid use, overuse, and uh, possible regulatory changes into where they should be used uh, into the future so if I, I don't we don't really have time to go into all the details of that but I would leave uh, this up uh, you can find this article online I think it's uh, available free through science if you google it or use the information here in the citation to bring it down Yeah, thank you, Matt. And yeah, can, yeah. go ahead. So, uh, yeah, I was just looking at the the question board here. Kenny notes uh, there's a lot of interest in the sublethal effects of neonicotinoids. Um, yeah, uh, there's been quite a bit of data now coming out that uh, even at low doses, not enough to kill an insect, say like a, a bee, uh, the neonics can have a negative effect on their behavior and health. The question really is how often does that happen and, and how much of that 
sublethal effect is contributing to some of the declines we see in honeybee populations and native uh, bee populations because neonics are just one of the things that one of the negative things that those pollinators are facing in our environment and Carl writes any thoughts on ladybugs and aphids um, not quite sure uh, what you're asking there Carl ladybugs lady beetles the um, the predator, uh, that, the predators that feed on aphids are a substantial source of mortality for aphids, uh, especially the soybean aphid and um, yeah, <laughs> ladybug beetles. Uh, one of the most important ones we think is, uh, or at least one that responds to the aphid is called Harmonia axoritis. And this is the multicolored Asian lady beetle that we find in our homes. Uh, when there's an aphid outbreak, a soybean aphid outbreak in a soybean field, uh, those lady beetles tend to come in and their populations really build up. And uh, uh, it's not uncommon for homes around a soybean field after an outbreak to see a lot more of those lady beetles in the fall. Okay, great. Um, yeah, thanks so much, Matt. I think uh, now is probably a good time to, to call it a night. Uh, we, we've exhausted the questions in the chat box, um, but thanks everybody for, for attending and asking some really great questions. And a huge thanks to Dick for um, sharing his experience and his research, and a big thanks to Matt for the same, sharing his experience and his research. So thanks guys for putting together these presentations. Yeah. and. Please Thanks. feel free to contact me if you're interested in uh, either parasitoid release or maybe testing some of our aphid resistant lines. Thanks, everybody.